God never will. Man, I could stay on that for a while. God never will lose a battle. We continue in this series of what it means to live a life unbound. This is the third week in the series, and we have learned more about Lazarus' situation. And I would say not just Lazarus' situation, but those who were around Lazarus was released in their ability to trust God more faithfully. And then we talked about the Samaritan woman and Jesus um, having to go against legalism and opposition and what it meant to do the right thing, uh, even when met with opposition. And today we will hear about what it means to be unbound from demonic spirits. I'm sure don't anybody get up and leave. It's going to be all right. Um, we find that Jesus, having completed miracle upon miracle uh, in this gospel of Matthew, that Jesus has healed the sick and the afflicted and the infirm. Uh, Jesus has uh, just come from calming the storms on the seashore, on the sea, and then he gets to the shore. What a welcoming from these demonics. I ask as you are able to please stand as you are able for the reading of God's written word from the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew beginning in the 8th chapter, verses 28 through 34, the healing of two demon-possessed men. When he arrived at the other side in the region of Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met them. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God, they shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs were feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. This is God's word for us, God, his children, and together we say, thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. God, we recognize that life often is challenging. And in our time together today, God, may we hear from you as to how best to overcome some of these challenges in a world that does have evil, but your word says that greater is you that is in us than that which is in the world. So God, we thank you and we pray for your anointing to abide and to reside to transform, have thine own way, God. Amen. And so can you imagine Jesus having done all that he had done, and I would imagine desiring to just breathe and to come on shore and to be greeted by two demonics. Can you imagine now, you all have met some pretty angry people, I would imagine, along life's journey, but nothing I would imagine could compare to what this experience was for Jesus. And so it says that Jesus met in the region of Gerasene. And if you read all three synoptic gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they're synoptic in that they all have similarities. This particular miracle 
is undisputed. Its historicity is one that we are called to pay attention to. That is to say that this happened. There is thought that perhaps the geographics um, are slightly different, but in terms of what happened, as the kids say, what had happened was this actually occurred. And I emphasize that because I think it's so important for us to recognize that there are things in the Bible that we would prefer not to talk about. Yes, yes. And my guess is that one of them is demons is not anything that we really want to talk about. Is that right? Yes. Demons are a mystery in many ways, and yet not to talk about it, oh my gosh, would provide such fertile ground for Satan. For you see, Satan is real. The enemy is real. The word of God says that the enemy, Satan, comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And if we do not equip ourselves and understand the power of the enemy to infiltrate our lives, we really could find ourselves in some challenging places. And so understand this, is that the devil is talked about in other religions, but as we understand it in the Christian faith, uh, the enemy came on the scene around, I want to say Genesis 3, in the form of the serpent. And so it is said that this was a fallen archangel, that um, he, he did not have room for God in his life. And so he was expelled from heaven, and other angels were brought with him. And so you have this, this, this resource of demonic spirits, demoniacs, that infiltrate the world. And if you don't believe it, I have a few places that I can take you. I have a few places that I can take you. I used to work at Bentop Hospital and to work in some of the units there where people were um, substance abuse and had taken particular drugs and it was ungodly what my eyes have seen as a result of the evil spirits in this world. And so as we come to understand this particular passage, I invite you to discern where you find yourself in this passage. It's an interesting notion that as Jesus got out of the boat and the two demoniacs saw Jesus, they recognized Jesus. What does that say? Is that even the demons fear the Lord. The demons, the evil spirits recognize God. And Jesus had just gotten out of the boat with the disciples and they were like, who is this man who's come in the sea? Who, 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 who? People who had been with him still were challenged to recognize who God was right there in their midst. And yet you had the craftiness and the cunningness of demons who recognize them. And I lift that up to say that evil spirits look for vulnerable Christians. Evil spirits look for vulnerable Christians. And so we are called to recognize that we have to stay equipped to be ahead of the enemy. So it is a great thing that we have joined together in worship today to grow in our faith. And that is something that we're called to continue to do. But in the meantime, back to the scripture. The demons saw God and they pleaded with God to not send them back to the abyss, not to send them back to hell, but send me, I think I heard a child gasp because I said that word. Um, I'll talk to them when they get home, but it's, it's a place that's real. 
Even the demons did not want to go back there. What does that tell us about H-E-L-L? What does that tell us? That the demons wanted at least to be cast into the pigs. And so what happened was is that Jesus granted them that. And Jesus said, go, go. And immediately they departed. The word hoopago. Hoopago means to uh, bring under. It means to go away. It means to be gone, to die. And so the demons, the demoniac spirits, uh, in the other two gospels, uh, Mark and Luke, it's referred to as legion. That is demons, many demons, many left those two men. Those two men were human beings, you all. We're not talking about some creatures. We're not talking about monsters. We're talking about human beings that found a place. I mean, demons that found a place in the human being. Now, the, these folk that they found a place in did not have a relationship with God. I said something there. They found a place to reside because God did not reside in them. And that's important for us to recognize. When we are absent of a relationship with God, that is exactly where the demons want to come. But there is great news here today. I could preach a long time and y'all would probably be like this, like in the Baptist church, leaving out of here. Because this is important for us to understand, is that we wrestle with spiritual forces that are in conflict with God's will. James 4 says it this way. It says, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, I don't expect any of us to go out and buy a t-shirt and wear it, because that's not going to protect us from the enemy. But that word is a word that we're called to live in and through faithfully, and that is to submit to God. Submit means to yield, to understand that we live in a broken, fallen world, and we cannot journey alone, separate and apart from God, God's word, God's will. And there are ways by which we are called to live out our faith. So no, don't buy the t-shirt Allow the words from the t-shirt to reside within and to be modeled in your daily walk with God. And if that's not enough, then we are called to understand what uh, Paul says to us in Ephesians. This is one of the most powerful passages in the Bible. And so it doesn't matter how we dress every day, but I wanna invite you to suit up. On my desk, I have this soldier. And this is from Ephesians, the sixth chapter. And around Ephesians, the sixth chapter, it says this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Now, I want to pause there to help us to understand that when Jesus saw those two men, he understood that something else was going on. Jesus saw beneath their flesh. He saw beneath what we see in one another, and he saw a deeper need. He saw that there were two people who had been consumed with evil, and he did something extraordinary. I pray that none of us ever find ourselves in a situation where it becomes that grave and that dark, but there's still hope. It goes on to say, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Y'all, I know that this is perhaps challenging for us to listen to and to talk about, 
but all that we need do is to pay attention to what has happened in our world. What, hap what is happening in our world is not of God. What is happening in our world in many places and circumstances where there's anger and frustration and just so much violence, and did I say hatred, is that God is not the goal. A relationship with God is not at the core of these situations, cannot exist together cannot coexist together. God will always win out. And so when we look at the situation, we're called to understand that much like Paul understood, is that we have to pay attention to the spiritual realm of this world. You know that we are flesh and spirit, right? And so it's important for us every day. Now, you're not going to ever see me adorned like this. I like different type clothing, but this is not going to happen. But this is so symbolic because we have to suit up every day. Our head, the helmet of salvation, and, and the breastplate of, of righteousness and we've got to protect all of who we are, the thoughts that we think how we allow ourselves to feel and to be overcome by feelings and thoughts and to hold fast to the armor of God. Can we do that? Do we understand the necessity of walking daily with God suited up for battle because the enemy is real and we are not going to become campgrounds for the enemy. Thank you, Lord. We are not going to become campgrounds for the enemy. And so as we continue to think about it, C.S. Lewis, and I thought it was interesting coming from someone who was agnostic to be able to form this type of understanding as an agnostic that became a Christian to understand that demons are real. He says this, he says, when speaking about the reality of Satan and demonic activity, the danger is always twofold. To put away too much emphasis, to put way too much emphasis or too little emphasis. Did you hear that? We can think too much about it and become frightened, or we can not pay it any attention and be lured into it. So he goes on to say, to put to some, there's a demon behind every door. To others, demons are no longer among us. The truth is, there is highly organized armies of satanic forces today operating in this world, just as in the Bible days. The evil spirits seek to inhabit human lives in order to find expression in this realm. Think about that. They look to find residence in this world today. And we know that it's happening. We have choices that we are called to make. And again, I would want us to recognize that God has given us everything that we need to combat the enemy in and through his power and the authority that he gives us in his word. And so what he did for the demoniacs was beyond the comprehension of the people there that witnessed it. Because to them, those people were useless. Those people did not have a place in society. And I would have to admit, submit, I could see how the people could get to that point 
in their recognition of those people. After all, they had behaved in horrific ways, right? And there seemed to be nothing redemptive about them. But God. But God. And as I was reading this passage, I was so reminded of the Apostle Paul. And I'm so reminded of how evil Paul was and how Paul did not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and how the enemy had taken camp in Paul's life. But God, Philippians tells us this in Philippians 3, 12 through 14. And someone today needs to understand this. Someone needs to hear this, is that perhaps you or someone you love or someone you just know has gone through some dark patches, and it seems as though they are irredemptable, that there is no room for God in their life. There, there is no possibility of healing and deliverance but God. God says this in his word in Philippians, and Paul owns this. He says, not that I have already attained or am already perfect, but pressing on that I lay hold of the Jesus Christ in me. He said, brethren, I do not count myself to be apprehended, but one thing I do, one thing that I do, forgetting those things which are behind me and to press forward to the mark of the higher calling. Those demoniacs, had some choices they had to make once Jesus had delivered them and set them free. And no, none of us in here fall in that category. I don't believe so. But what we're called to remember is that we are all sinners saved by grace. But by the grace of God, there go I. And so for each of us every day to recognize the grace of God, the healing power that God gives all of God's children. And how might we play a role in that? For you see, when they were healed and delivered, the word of God says that the people in the town got very upset. The word doesn't tell us that they made room for them, that they welcomed them, let alone welcome Jesus. They were like, we need you to go. Now, if Jesus had done something that profound, I'm not sure that I would want him to go. I I think I would want to know, so you did that for them. How can you impact my life? I don't know. I'm just saying that. I wasn't there. But they were not at a place where they had a relationship with God to trust that God could do for them which none other. The Bible says in some commentaries that they were consumed because that was their money, those pigs falling into the abyss. Some say that there were those among them who were not ready to have a relationship with God. I know that to be all too true myself. I've had people that tell me, this is what's going on in my life, but I trust you to tell you this. I'm not ready to change. And all that I could do was pray with and for them. There were those people in the crowd. And then there were those people that just did not know how to think, and so the choice was, Just go, just go. But Jesus is opening up his life to us. And there on the cross bore all of our sins, even the demoniacs, so that those who believe in Jesus Christ can be changed for all eternity. I tell you what, Eugene Peterson, he did a job with the Bible, the message. He cut straight to the chase in his translations. 
He leaves us with this word because I think it's a profound word when we think about this passage and when we think about life. Eugene Peterson says this, the end is where we start from. In my end is my beginning. Endings take precedence over beginnings. We begin a journey by first deciding on a destination. If our destination is heaven, then Jesus Christ is the one who we are called to follow. Trusting God as Job trusted God, even though they slay me, I will trust you. Yes, the enemy is going to come against you, but the enemy will not, cannot overtake you because we belong to God. Keep your focus on Jesus, the author and the finisher of every last one of our faith. And God will care for us, and heaven will be our destination. May it be so that you and I and all of God's children would have victory in Jesus. Thanks be to God for what is and is yet to be. Amen.